Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, Miss Thackeray. So today um, I'm going over monthly number 12, and our focus today is humor and comedy in our mutual friend. So I mean, oh, the guiding question is how does Dickens awaken thoughtful laughter in this monthly? In other words, how does he make you laugh and think at the same time? So I'm going to play a clip from a movie called Stranger Than Fiction. Um, starring Will Ferrell. Um, Will Ferrell in this movie is an accountant and one day he's walking along the street and he realizes someone is narrating his life and the narrator says little did Harold know that he was about to die. So he doesn't want to die so he goes to this uh, English professor played by Dustin Hoffman who is helping him try to decide whether his story is a tragedy or a comedy. Some underlying thing. Well, I've always wanted my life to be more musical. Like West Side Story? No. Like, well, well, I've always wanted to learn to play the guitar. is whether you're in a comedy or a tragedy. The code evil Calvino, the ultimate meaning to which Okay, pay attention to that. Whether he's in a tragedy or comedy, now he's going to define them. All stories refer has two faces. Continuity of life, inevitability of death. Tragedy, die, comedy, get hitched. Most comic heroes fall in love with people who are introduced after the story has begun, usually people who hate the hero of the mission, although I can't imagine anyone hating you, Harold. Professor Hilbert, I'm an IRS agent. Everyone hates me. All right, oh, good. Have you met anyone recently who might loathe the very core of you? I just started arguing the one who told me to get bent. Well, that sounds like a comedy. Try to develop that. Okay. Okay, back to the presentation. So, again, guiding question. How does Dickens awaken thoughtful laughter in this monthly? In other words, how does he make you laugh and think at the same time? So, comedy defined. According to Aristotle, the first drama critic, comedy aims at representing men as worse than in actual life. Comedy does not show man's nobler, more heroic actions and emotions. Rather, it shows us many lower, more foolish concerns. It makes us laugh at our petty interests, our limited views of life. So, this is what you need to write down in your notes, right here. Okay, comic vision. Ability of man to keep going, to persist, to overcome with grace, or courage, or dumb luck. Tragedy celebrates man's nobility in suffering and defeat. Comedy celebrates man's genius for endurance and survival. So, in the clip, he said, Elo Calvino said that in a comedy, you get hitched, and in a tragedy, you die. So, very simple to remember those. <clears throat> so the comic mask, comedy Northrop Fry has said, lies between satire and romance. Historically, there have been two chief kinds of comedy, scornful comedy and romantic comedy. Scornful comedy makes us laugh, romantic comedy makes us smile. These are the rom-coms. Okay, so there are five divisions of comedy. There's low comedy, comedy of manners, satire, comedy of chaos, and high comedy. So, um, giving you some examples of each of those. Um, low comedy is like slapstick, belly laughs, um, unruly, you've got pranks, um, nuttiness, so things like Charlie Chaplin, Chaplin sorry, The Three Stooges, Lucille Ball, um, clowns. Um, and then your comedy of manners. Um, these are 
comedies that evoke warm, sympathetic laughter, everyday social situations. You've got stereotypes. Um, Shakespeare, his comedies in, uh, are comedy of manners. You have drunks and misers and hypocrites and brats. Um, the um, oh, the dramatic teenage girl, the hot-headed young teenage boy. Um, with satire, you know, you know, we've been studying satire with Dickens. Um, uh, critical, gently mocking, most of it, if it's Horatian satire. Um, the goal is to reform and expose. Comedy of chaos is more modern comedy. These are um, for most forbidding laughs in desperation. Um, theater of the absurd, you've got black humor. Um, you've got a lot of grotesque, um, uncomfortable humor. Um, things like Catch-22 um, or, um, oh, I'm trying to think right now, having a, having a brain cramp. But again, th this is comedy that includes the grotesque. And then high comedy, um, this is comedy that um, has a dreamlike quality. Everything is resolved in the end. There's a spirit of harmony. Harmony. Um, it you laugh with compassion. Things like as you like it or um, oh Pride and Prejudice. Those kinds of things. Okay. Um, conventional comedy. Plausibility is not usually the central characteristic of a comic plot. Unlikely coincidences, improbable disguises, mistaken identities. These are the stuff of which comedy is made. And as long as they make us laugh and at the same time help to illuminate human nature and folly, we need not care greatly. Melodrama attempts to arouse feelings of fear and pity. Conflict is oversimplified and sensational. Incidents provide the staple of the plot. I always think of um, Dudley Do-Right. I don't know if you ever guys ever watch stuff like that. It's a cartoon. Uh-oh, an announcement. Or not. Um, you know, a woman would be tied to the railroad tracks and the train would be coming and Dudley Do-Right would come in and save the day. Um, most important is that good triumphs over evil and the ending is happy. Typically, um, at the end, the hero marries the heroine, villainy is spoiled or crushed. So, comedy, you get hitched. Farce, aimed at rousing explosive laughter by cruder means. The conflicts are violent and usually at the physical level. Comic implausibility is raised to heights of absurd impossibility, coarse wit, practical jokes. Oh my goodness, what just happened there? Oh, geez, I don't want to rate my experience. Thank you very much. Um, close. How rude. Okay, um, that was farce, pickle. <laughs> Characters trip over benches. <laughs> like he's back to running into de desks. Insult each other, run into walls, knock each other down. So, back to the guiding question. How does Dickens make us laugh? We're going to examine techniques and then explore the purpose of comedy in the second chapter, uh, second chapter of monthly number 12. Okay, so off with your heads. Not me. Really. Um, okay, first we're going to talk about chapter one. So, let's move this out of the way. I'm British now. Okay. Um, so, at the end of monthly number 11, Bella told her father that prosperity was ruining, ruining Mr. Boffin. So, where do we see evidence of that? Um, well, page 456. Um, And this is the Golden Dust Man Falls into Bad Company. The opening paragraph where Bella Wilfer's bright and ready little wits at were Bella Wilfer's bright and ready little wits at fault, or was 
the golden dustman passing through the furnace of proof and coming out dross. Ill news travels fast, we shall uh, know full soon. On that very night of her return from the happy return, something chanced which Bella closely followed with her eyes and ears. There was an apartment at the side of the Boffin ma mansion known as Mr. Boffin's room. Far less grand than the rest of the house, it was far more comfortable being pervaded by a certain air of homely smugness which upholstering despotism had banished to that spot when it inexorably set its face against Mr. Boffin's appeals for mercy in behalf of any other chamber. So, um, she comes upon Mr. Boffin um, talking to the secretary, Mr. Rokesmith, and he has decided that he's going to summon Rokesmith with a bell. Um, and why does he do this? Um, well, he says that, um, where is it? Um, he has let Rogue Smith get above his work. He's also going to set his salary. No longer will he be spending time at the Wilfers. He will be living full time at the Boffin Mansion. Um, because he says, I want to keep you in attendance. It's convenient to have you at all times ready on the premises. Um, and notice that Mr. Boffin, who used to comically amble, we, I've pointed this out before, is now trotting. And now he's stopping short in his trot. Um, and then Mr. Boffin says on page 459, we've got to hold our own now against everybody, for everybody's hand is stretched out to be dipped into our pockets, and we've got to re recollect that money makes money. And then in the middle of the page he said, I have found out that you must either scrunch them or let them scrunch you. Scrunch? No, no T. Scrunch. Now, you know, it's sad that Mr. Boffin is cha being changed, but I think it's understandable because people have been asking him for money. He is starting to become cynical because you know, of what people want from him. And we know, even though he doesn't know, that um, Wegg is conspiring against him. So it makes sense. But um, Bella ventured for a moment to look stealthily towards him under her eyelashes, and she saw a dark cloud of suspicion, covetousness, and conceit overshadowing the once open face. So, um, he takes Bella shopping with him, and he wants to buy books about misers. So the illustration on page 462 is of Bothan with Bella going to bookstores. It says, Bibliomania of the Golden Dust Man. Um, and then uh, another thing that we find out, plot point, is that Mrs. Lamley made the discovery that Bella had a fascinating influence over her. The Lamleys, originally presented by the Dear Veneerings, visited the Boffins on all grand occasions, and Mrs. Lamley had not previously found this out, but now the knowledge came upon her all at once. Um, she was foolishly susceptible of the power of beauty, but it wasn't altogether that. She never had been able to resist the natural grace of manner, but it wasn't altogether that. It was more than that, and there was no name for the indescribable extent and degree to which she was captivated by this charming girl. Um, and 
Um, on 464, it says, but between Bella Wilfer and Georgiana Posnap, there was this one difference among many others, that Bella was in no danger of being captivated by Alfred. Um, so, and then on 465, Bella tells Sophroni about Roke Smith's proposal, which can't be good, because then on 466, it says, um, this time Sophroni was so much in earnest that she found it necessary to bend forward in the carriage and give Bella a kiss, a Judas order of a kiss, for she thought, while well, she yet pressed Bella's hand after giving it, upon my your own showing, you vain, heartless girl, puffed up by the doting follow of a dustman, I have n need, I need have no relenting towards you. Um. So, um, does this foreshadow a betrayal? Well, maybe you should think about that. Um, then on 468, we see another change in Boffin where he tells um, uh, Roke Smith that he is the master. Um, and then at the end of this chapter, 470, um, it says, Bella thought it was well for his wife that she was musing with her affectionate face on his shoulder, for there was a cunning light in his eyes as he said all this, which seemed to cast a disagreeable illumination on the change in him and make it morally uglier. So that does not bode well. Um, okay. Then we get to chapter 6. Um, the Golden Dust Man falls into worse company. And this is the chapter where we're going to examine uh, the comedy um, that Dickens uses and whether it's high, low, comedy of manners, so on. Um, so the scene that I want to look at is the scene um, that starts at the bottom of 475. Um, and we're examining how he awakens thoughtful laughter. Um, you will be writing about this on your quiz. Um, and you'll need two concrete details from the text to support uh, your answer. So it begins, Mr. Wegg, so he goes to uh, the Bower and brings his miser books and asks Wegg to read about Dancer. Mr. Wegg pursued the biography of that eminent man through his, its various phases of avarice and dirt. Through Miss Dancer's death on a sick regimen, of cold dumpling and through Mr. Dancer's keeping his rags together with a hay band and warming his dinner by sitting upon it down to the consolatory incident of his dying naked in a sack after which he read on as follows. The house or rather the heap of ruins in which Mr. Dancer lived and which at his death devolved to the right of Captain Holmes was a most miserable decayed building for it had not been repaired for more than half a century. And then Dickens uses a parenthetical insertion. Okay, so let's see, 475. Think of it here as stage directions. So, you know, it's like a director would be telling the actors what to do. So, while he's reading, then Wegg eyed his comrade and the room in which they sat, which had not been prepared for a long time. But though poor in external structure, the ruinous fabric was very high in the interior. It took many weeks to explore its whole contents, and Captain Holmes found it very agreeable task to dive into the miser's secret hoards. Now we have another parenthetical insertion. Here Mr. Wegg repeated secret hordes and pegged his comrade again. One of Mr. Dancer's rich, richest esquitoires was found to be a dung heap in the cow house. A sum but little short of 200, 500 pounds was contained in this rich 
piece of manure and an old jacket carefully tied and strongly nailed down to the manger in which banknotes and gold were found 500 pounds more. Another parenthetical insertion. Here Mr. Wegg's wooden leg started forward under the table and slowly elevated itself as he read on. Now his wooden leg has become animated. <clears throat> Several bowls were discovered filled with guineas and half guineas and at different times on searching the corners of the house they found various parcels of banknotes. Some were crammed into the crevices of the wall. Here Mr. Venus looks at the wall. Bundles were hid under the cushions and covers of the chairs. Here Mr. Venus looked under himself on the settle. Some were reposing snugly at the back of the drawers and notes amounting to 600 pounds were found neatly doubled up in the inside of an old teapot. In the stable, the captain found jugs full of old dollars and shillings. The chimney was not left unsearched and paid very well for the trouble, for in 19 different holes, all filled with soot, were found various sums of money amounting together to more than 200 pounds. On the way to this crisis, Mr. Wegg's wooden leg had gradually elevated itself more and more, and he had nudged Mr. Venus with his opposite elbow deeper, deeper and deeper until at length the preservation of his balance became incompatible with the two actions, and he now dropped over sideways upon the gentleman, squeezing him against the settle's edge. Nor did either of the two for some few seconds make any effort to recover himself, both remaining in a kind of pecuniary swoon. Um, both... Wegg and Venus fall down in a pecuniary swoon. Now, if you were here, I would say, what is a swoon? Well, like, you're in love. Pecuniary. Having to do with money. So, they are in love with money. It's like they're so excited, Mr. Wegg's leg elevates as if he is aroused by the thought of all this hidden money, if you get my drift. This is what you call body humor. Okay, this is slapstick. Low comedy. <clears throat> but, well, and then, um, but the sight of Mr. Boffin sitting in the armchair hugging himself with his eyes upon the fire acted as a restorative. Counterfeiting a sneeze to cover their movements, Mr. Webb with a spasmodic to shoot pulled himself and Mr. Venus up in a masterly manner. Let's have some more, said Mr. Boffin hungrily. hungrily. Okay, so the whole time Webb is reading, Boffin is just sitting in the armchair like hugging himself because he too is in love with money. Um, how this awakens thoughtful laughter? Well, you know, it's funny, but again, the thought of someone being so aroused by the thought of all this hidden money to the point of them falling over, um, you know, makes you think of the greed that money and the desire for money can cause one. And even Boffin being so oblivious to what is going on right in front of him that he doesn't even notice that they fall over um, shows you know, how he is so consumed with the idea of holding on to his money. So um, then we find out, so Mr. He reads some more and then Mr. Boffin leaves. And um, then uh, Wegg reveals to Venus that he has found a will. And, oh, well, first of all, okay, well, before that, um, Boffin leaves and he takes a lamp with him and they go out and uh, he goes out to his mound. And he was uh, going to dig with whatsoever object for he tucked up his cuffs and spat on his hands and then went at it like an old digger. This is on 482. And he pulls up a short necked glass bottle which the dustman is said to keep his courage in. As soon as he had done this, he turned off his lantern, and they could hear that he was filling up the hole in the dark. The ashes being easily moved by a skillful hand, the spies took this as a hint 
um, to make off in good time. Accordingly, Mr. Venus slipped past Mr. Wegg and towed him down. But Mr. Wegg's descent was not accomplished without some personal inconvenience for his self-willed leg sticking into the ashes about halfway down and time pressing. Mr. Venus took the liberty of hauling him from his tether by the collar, which occasioned him to make the rest of the journey on his back with his head enveloped in the skirts of his coat and his wooden leg coming last like a drag. And again, this is more of that low comedy, dragging him down um, as he goes. Um, and then, uh, you know, Wegg gets really angry, and at the end of this chapter, as in his wildness, he was making a strong struggle for it. Mr. Venus deemed it expedient to lift him, throw him, and fall with him, well knowing that once down, he would not be up again easily with his wooden legs. So they both rolled on the floor as they did so. Mr. Boffin shut the gate. And of course, Mr. Boffin is completely oblivious to the shenanigans going on. Okay, then we get to the last chapter, chapter seven. Um, Friendly move takes up a strong position. And this is where Wegg reveals to Venus that he has found another will. And um, it, he found it in an oblong cash box, and it's my will, and John Harmon temporarily deposited here. And he tells him that this will is dated after the will that gave the money to John Harmon, and in that case he was dead or didn't follow through with the uh, stipulations that it went to the Boffins. And um, Venus says, um, Wegg says he's going to hold on to it, and, and um, Venus says, oh dear, no partner, retorted Venus, that's a mistake, I am. Now look here, Mr. Wegg, I don't want to have any words with you, and still less do I want to have any anatomical pursuits with you. And then, on 489, um, what do you mean, Mr. Venus, asked Wegg, I'm surrounded, because they're now at Venus's shop, as I have observed, Mr. Venus said Mr. Venus placidly, by the trophies of my art. They are numerous. My stock of human wares is large. The shop is pretty well crammed. And I ju don't just now want any more trophies of my art, but I like my art and I know how to exercise my art. No man better, assented, assented Mr. Wegg with a somewhat staggered air. There's the miscellaneous of several human species, said Venus, although you mightn't think it in the box on which you're sit sitting. There's the miscellaneous of several human specimens in the lovely comp compo one behind the door with a nod towards the French gentleman. It still wants a pair of arms. I don't say that. I'm in a hurry for him. You must be wandering in your mind, partner. You'll excuse me if I wander. I am sometimes rather subject to it. I like my art, and I know how to exercise my art, and I mean to, ha the, ha to have the keeping of this document. So um, he's threatening him, basically, by saying, I'm surrounded by the trophies of my art, and I know how to exercise my art. In other words, I can cut you up if you don't let me keep that will. Um, I am surrounded by the trophies of my art and I know how to exercise my art, if you know what I mean. So, um, Silas Wade glanced at the kettle, glanced at the shelves, glanced at the French gentleman behind the door, and shrank a little as he glanced at Mr. Venus, winking his red eyes and feeling in his way coast pocket uh, as for a lancet, say, with his unoccupied hand, he and Venus were successfully seated close together um, as each held a corner of the document. Wegg suggests they cut it in half, which of course would nullify that. So he says, what's the course to be pursued on this hand? Head, what Silas had much to say. Silas said um, that he is going to hold on to it. Um, and then he also lets him know, well, let's see, that um, he is you know, a little wary about things and his getting into this matter because, well, his love interest, who he was feeling low about, um, might have a change of heart. And we find out that his love interest is none other than 
pleasant riderhood. And isn't that funny that she said she didn't want to be seen in a bony light, but look who her father is. He's the worst of wor the worst. Um, so, um, Reg says he's going to, or Venus is going to hold on to the will. And uh, with a disappointed face, Silas mentally consigned this parrot to regions more than tropical and seeming for the time to have lost his power of assuming an interest in the woes of Mr. Venus fell to tightening his wooden leg as a preparation for departure. His gymnastic performance of that evening having se severely tried its constitution. For Silas, uh, for Silas Wegg felt it to be quite out of the question that he could lay his head upon his pillow in peace without first hovering over Mr. Boffin's house in the superior character of its evil genius. Power, unless it be the power of intellect or virtue, has ever the greatest attraction for the lowest natures and the mere defiance of the unconscious house front with his power to strip the roof of, off the inhabiting family like the roof of a house of cards was a treat which, treat which had a charm for Silas Wegg. And this is something he has in common with Lamley. Not Lamley, Fledgeby. Power. As I told you last time, it's a theme. Um, so, as Mr. Wegg uh, stumps home after hovering over Mr. Boffin's house in the superior character of the evil genius, he rattles out the line, he's grown too fond of money for that, he's grown too fond of money. Um, As he does, he um, <clears throat> says, piano with his own foot and forte with his wooden leg. So he's like, he's grown too fond of money for that. He's grown too fond of money. He's grown too fond of money for that. He's grown too fond of money. So loud and soft. So there we have it, the end of monthly number 12. Um, the quiz will be at the beginning of class right after something good when we get back and you should have read 13 and 14 and then there will be quiz on that so have a lovely spring break toodaloo